Hi, I'm Mike Hines, and welcome to the seven minute teacher's portion of Launchbox, which will be followed immediately by the 20 minute student's portion. Today we'll be covering the development of the spacesuit. I hope you're taping the show because we've got a lot of ground to cover and we'll be moving rather quickly. Don't worry, you can always go back later and spend as much time as you need. Ready? Today's goals. Students will understand and gain knowledge about the history, purpose and need, construction, design and parts, and spin-offs of the spacesuit. We recommend that you develop a teaching unit using this presentation. Please preview this unit in order to individualize it to the needs of your grade, teaching assignment, time, purpose, and materials needed. It is also suggested that you order supplemental resources before starting this unit. A short list of resources will be provided at the end of the teacher section. The need for a spacesuit began as far back as pioneer aviator Wiley Post in the 1930s. He knew that protection against low pressure at high altitudes was necessary if man was going to venture there. When NASA's Mercury program began on October 7, 1958, the spacesuit was nothing more than a high altitude jet flight suit. It only served as a pressure backup should the aircraft's cabin lose pressure. The first American astronaut to wear the jet flight suit into space was Alan B. Shepard on May 5, 1961. The other Mercury astronauts who followed were Virgil Gus Grissom in 1961, John Glenn in 1962, Scott Carpenter in 1962, Walter Schirra in 1962, and Gordon Cooper in 1963. Donald K. Slayton followed later during the Apollo program. But when the Gemini flights began, the flight suit no longer proved adequate. The Gemini suit not only had to serve as a pressure backup, but also as an escape suit if ejection was necessary. In addition, it had to serve as an EMU, or extravehicular mobility unit to accommodate human activity outside a pressurized spacecraft. Such activity is known as EVA or extravehicular activity. The Gemini suit was a construction that employed a bladder restrained by a link net. The bladder was a custom fitting anthropomorphic or human shaped layer of neoprene coated nylon. The first American to actually use a spacesuit as an EMU for a walk in space was Edward H. White on June 3, 1965. At the completion of the Gemini program, NASA astronauts had logged 12 hours of EVA experiences. Despite the success of the Gemini EMU, at the start of the Apollo program, it became necessary to have a spacesuit that was more flexible and had better cooling methods if NASA was to achieve their goals of orbiting the Earth and landing a man on the moon. And it was with great pride that on July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 landed the first men on the moon. Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin. These projects and suits were forerunners to the shuttle suit being used today. While the early suits were tailor-made for each astronaut, that process was expensive and time-consuming. But before I tell you a little about today's shuttle spacesuit, let me just mention that we are now going to show you some lesson suggestions. Each block of information will only be on screen for a short time, so it will probably be necessary for you to go back later and pause on each one to take adequate notes. Please remember that these are suggestions only. To continue, today's suits are made in five different sizes and can be worn by either men or women. In fact, only the gloves are custom fitted. And the shuttle suit is more durable and easier to move in than any of its predecessors. Why do we even need space suits? Well, in order to explore and work in space outside the confines of a spacecraft where conditions can be controlled, Human beings must take their environment with them because in space, there's no atmospheric pressure and no oxygen to sustain life. So spacesuits supply oxygen for breathing and maintain a constant pressure around the body to keep body fluids in a liquid state. In space, air pressure is not sufficient to keep body fluids from boiling. The spacesuit also insulates the astronaut from the temperature extremes of space and protects him or her from deadly hazards such as micrometeoroids. The spacesuit, or EMU, consists of 17 separate components. The liquid cooling and ventilation garment, the hard upper torso, 
the arm assembly, the helmet and extravehicular visor assembly, the communications carrier assembly, the display and control module, the airlock adapter plate, the primary life support subsystem, the gloves, the secondary oxygen pack, the contaminant control cartridge, the battery, the service and cooling umbilical, the in-suit drink bag, the urine collection device, the lower torso assembly, and the EMU electrical harness. All in all, a very complicated and important part of man's exploration of space. All space technology produces spin-offs, or practical applications in ordinary society, and the spacesuit is no different. The following is a list of several spin-offs that are results of spacesuit technology. Human factor research, including environmental influences, limitations, capabilities, and efficiency. Solar research, the microcomputer, communication systems, structofab, a lightweight but extremely durable material, anti-fog compounds, self-contained ecosystems, various medical applications, including the heart monitor, ocular screening systems, and lung diagnosis, vehicle controllers for the handicapped, microbe detectors, fire safety systems and clothing, absorbent materials, metallic filters, rehydrated foods, and Velcro, believe it or not. Did you get all that? I realize it's quite a bit of information to cover. This concludes the teacher's portion of our program. After a few seconds of black, the student's portion of Launchbox will begin. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> And welcome to Launchbox, the show that takes you to the stars and beyond. Today's episode, The Spectacular Spacesuit. Hi, what's your name? Michelle. Michelle, you know what this is? A balloon. That's right. Now, what do you think would happen to this balloon if we took it into space? Float away. Well, actually, I don't know. Let's take a look. See, today, earlier, we put a balloon inside of a bell jar and created a vacuum just like in space. You see, in space, there's no air. When there's no air, there's no air pressure. And when there's no air pressure, what happens, guys? That's right, we get an exploded balloon. Now, uh, actually, let's do that one more time in slow motion. That was kind of cool. Here we go. We're losing air pressure. Help me out again, guys. Boom! All right, now what do you think would happen if that would have been a person? Blow up. Uh, well, I don't know, but it could probably ruin your day. That's why a spacesuit's so important, you see? Because in space, not only does a spacesuit provide an astronaut with air, but it also provides him with a constant pressure around his body. A spacesuit also protects astronauts from dangers like, uh, stray mini meteors and extreme temperatures. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. Bruce, okay, the suit protects you, but who cares if it doesn't look good, right? So true. So that's why we're going to take a look at spacesuit fashions throughout the ages, what's hot and what's not. <laughs> Here 
Today we see pioneer aviator Wiley Post modeling the very latest in pressure suits. Well, the latest for the 1930s. And even though it provided him with enough pressure at very high altitudes, don't you think the bucket on his head clashes with his shirt? I mean, really. From here, we jump to those crazy fashions of the 60s, the kind worn by America's first astronauts. The seven Mercury astronauts were Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Virgil Gus Grissom, Walter Schirra, Alan Shepard Jr., and Donald K. Slayton. When Alan Shepard Jr. became the first American in space in 1961, his flight only lasted 15 minutes, so he didn't need much more than just a pressure backup suit. By the mid-60s, astronauts needed cool-looking suits, and if they could find something that they could move around in, that was good, too. It always helps if you can bend your knees, you know. They needed a suit that not only provided pressure backup, but also acted as an EMU, or extravehicular mobility unit. That means they could move around outside the ship. Here's Edward White on the first American spacewalk. Looks more like a space float to me. Here we see an example of space sportswear. Planning a scallop hike on the moon, racing in the big Lunar 500, or maybe you have your sights set on Olympic rock digging. Whatever the sport, the Apollo EMU is the suit for you. A better cooling system and even greater flexibility make the Apollo suit leaps and bounds better than the Gemini. No moon landing is complete without one. Go for it. When the Apollo program ended, and the shuttle program began, astronauts realized that what they really needed was the ultimate space party suit, and that's the EMU worn by today's space shuttle astronauts. The shuttle suit isn't tailor-made for each astronaut like all the other suits. It comes in five comfortable sizes and fits both men and women. In fact, only the gloves are custom-fitted anymore. Notice the simple, elegant styling. Never be bothered again by that pesky umbilical cord to the ship, and the shuttle suit is more durable and easier to move in than any of the other suits. It has to be. So the next time you're planning a big birthday bash in orbit, don't forget your space shuttle EMU. Pass the dip, dude. Tell me something, buddy. What's one thing you were never allowed to do at home? I'll jump off the furniture. Oh, bummer. I know how you feel. Personally, I'm never allowed to play my uh, stereo too loud at 3 in the morning. But hey, that's how it goes. You know, uh, space is not all that much different. Because when you're in space, there's still a lot of things that you cannot do. And that's why we have gone to the great extents, great lengths, to compile the official launch box top five list of things you definitely cannot do in a spacesuit. Here we go, guys. Number five, you can't scratch an itch. The suit covers every single itch of your body from head to toe. And uh, I think it's about time NASA comes up with a built-in scratcher. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Number four, you can't eat a bologna sandwich. Uh, actually, the only thing you can eat is a uh, food stick that comes with the helmet. And uh, as of right now, yeah, I know, as of right now, they have no bologna sandwich stick, so I'm kind of upset about that. <laughs> Number three, you can't comb your hair. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah! Your head's inside of a helmet. I mean, even if you tried, it wouldn't do you much good. As a matter of fact, when you're inside of a spacesuit, you can't even clip your nails or clean your ears. Yeah! All right. Which actually doesn't mean, really matter because you wouldn't... You all see it anyways. Number two, you can't see your wrist, wrist watch. I mean, why? You can't see your wrist watch. Does Mission Control not want you to know what time it is? Is this some sort of huge conspiracy or what? What's... Oh. oh, your suit covers your watch and you can't see it. <laughs> My bad. And now, guys, the number one thing that you definitely cannot do in a spacesuit. Never, ever, blow your nose. I know. Seriously, think about it. Like I said, your entire head is covered with the helmet. I mean, you can't even use your sleeve. I think it's about time NASA starts work on a built-in handkerchief. Huh? All right, now that was it, guys. The official launch box list of top five things you cannot do in a spacesuit. Remember that on your next mission. All right, right now, let's talk a little bit about what you can do in a spacesuit. And here to help us out with that is a man who actually helped engineer the spacesuit. Guys, help me welcome Brad Prouty. Yeah. How you doing, Brad? Good, thanks. Nice to see you here today. Is that thing comfortable? Yeah, it's not bad. It's pretty comfortable. What are you wearing underneath there? Well, what I've got on is something called a liquid cooling and ventilation garment. Uh -huh. It's one of those hanging up right there. It looks like a pair of long underwear. Yeah, it does. But it actually has about 300 feet of, di of small diameter tubing 
that allows cooling water to go over my body and keep me comfortable. And that's all this stuff like weaving in and out here? Exactly. What about the tube that runs down the arm and has this little hole on the end? When I'm enclosed inside the suit, there's an airflow that comes over my head and goes over the rest of my body, mm -hmm. and those tubes pick it up and return it to the life support system on my back. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, tell me something about the suit. What are the major parts of the suit? Okay, right here, the central part is called the hard upper torso. Yeah. And attached to that are several other major items. The arm right here is attached at the shoulder, and it has three bearings in it. There's a wrist bearing, there's an elbow bearing, uh -huh and then a shoulder bearing. Does that give you much movement capability? Oh, very much so. Really? That's pretty impressive. Attached to the arm are the gloves, and that's what allows the astronaut to grasp things and work out in space. Oh, okay. Attached here and down is what's yeah. called the lower torso assembly, and that includes a waist bearing that allows me to swivel, mm -hmm. the legs, and then the boots. On my back is what's called the backpack, which and is the life support system. That's, yeah, okay. That's right. And what that provides me is breathing air, pressurization, and also controls this cooling water that goes over my body. So that's a pretty important part of your suit, I Very guess. Very much so. What's located on my chest is what's called the display and controls module. Yeah. And this is what allows me to power up the system and control various inputs. Uh, there's a temperature dial here. I can change the cooling inside the suit. And there's a little display on the top here where I can read out information from the suit. What, um, how come... Uh all the letters and the numbers are backwards on your control panel. Okay, I can't see these controls from inside the suit with the helmet on, but with the assistance of a wrist mirror, mm -hmm. then I can read those and it's very easy to adjust. Oh, that makes sense. How about the, uh, the cap you've got on your head here? That's, That's called that. a Snoopy cap, Is and it? That, that contains earphones and a microphone so I can communicate. Oh, that's pretty cool. Can, can you not hear through the helmet when you get on? No, you wouldn't be able to hear without that. Ah, uh, okay. How much does this all weigh? It looks well, pretty heavy. Complete system on Earth weighs about 250 pounds. Oof. But remember, out in space where there's no gravity, yeah. it doesn't weigh anything. What does that feel like? Well, it's a little heavy right now, I but it's imagine. pretty comfortable. What about the uh, red stripes down here on the leg? Do those, uh, are those, do those have any significant meanings? Yes. When you're out in space, they usually, they always go out with two people. And what the red stripe indicates is the mission commander or the person in charge. Oh, that seems pretty handy enough. Well, whoa, where'd that table come from? No. Okay, well, we have a table here, and uh, we're actually going to take a look, a closer look at some of these gloves, and we have two volunteers from our audience to help us out. Guys, let's give them a hand. How you doing? What's your name? Sarita. And what's your name? Andy. All right, you guys just do me a favor here. Slip that glove on for me, and uh, you place that one on. While they're putting on the gloves, can you tell me a little bit about them? Okay, the gloves are a multi-layer construction mm -hmm. um, for insulation value. And there are also restraints or straps inside that, that retain them in certain positions. And for the palm, there's actually something called a palm bar. And that holds it from ballooning out when it's pressurized. It allows well, you to grasp things better. Oh, OK, I understand. Well, here's what we're going to do is uh, we're going we're gonna to test these gloves and see what kind of temperature they can withstand. And before we do, let's ask you about it. What... OK. The suit is designed to withstand temperatures from minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit uh -huh. up to 250 degrees plus. All right, we're going to put it to the ultimate test. Now, guys, remember, please, these are very, this is very sophisticated equipment, so please don't try this at home with your mother's working gloves or whatever you're using. All right, just to prove just how hot it is, here we go. Let's get a little flash here. Very hot. Go ahead, stick your hand in there. <coughs> All right, go ahead. Did you feel anything? No. How about you? Did you feel no. anything? No heat or anything? Nothing. Can you move your fingers around in that thing at all? Yeah, we can feel move like... around pretty good. Yeah? It's comfortable. It's good. Now, um, how come they couldn't feel... Uh, the total effects of the uh, of the pan. Well, the the materials themselves are chosen specifically to withstand heat, and also the multi layers of the gloves themselves. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, guys. You did a great job. Give them a hand. That was pretty. That was pretty brave of them. I must I must say. Um, you say the gloves have different layers. What about the suits? Is that is that also the same, same thing? Suits? That swatch right here is a uh, example of the layers in the suit. Mm -hmm. The first two are the layers that make up the liquid cooling garment and then starting from the yellow layer out which is where the suit starts that's a pressure retention layer that mm -hmm. holds the pressure inside the suit okay what about this next one here that's a retainer to it so that this bladder does not expand mm -hmm. and this, what's this black one do? well that's just a sort of a, a smooth layer between this layer and the five next layers which are all insulation uh-huh and then we go on to this last one that's inside. right that last layer is, a very, is very tough material. It's for abrasion protection and also micrometeorite protection. Uh, micrometeorites, what are those? 
Um, out in space is a fair amount of debris, or what uh -huh. you might call space dust, and that protects the whole system from that. So, you know, I've seen this thing laying here. What exactly is this? That's called an in-suit drink bag. Uh -huh. um, that's attached, and, and this end right here comes up through the helmet area, and if I'm out on a mission, which can last seven hours, wow. um, if I get thirsty, I can take a drink out of that. What, what do you do about food in that situation? Uh, not too much, but there is what's called a food stick that also sticks up in this area, and I can take mm -hmm. a bite off of that if I need to. Okay, let's say you're up there, you're sipping on your bag, eating your food stick, working on a space station. It's getting bright. I know it's got to get bright up there because of the sun and stuff. Do you guys bring along a pair of sunglasses? or? Well, in fact, we do. This helmet here has got three different visors in it. Cool. The first visor is simply just for protection of scratches and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The second visor is the set of shades, if you will. It's gold-coated and protects your eyes from the sun. What, what is actually the coating, the gold coating? It is actually that? is gold. Oh, really? That's right. Check that out. Is it worth anything? Can you see through it? Yes, you can. It's put on extremely thin, and you can see right through it. Wow. Now, is, if you want to block the sun totally from your eyes, there are other shades that you can put down, either on the sides, mm -hmm. okay, all the way down, or this central one that comes down partway. And that totally blocks the sun out of your eyes. That's a pretty handy thing. I might want to borrow that sometime. <laughs> okay. Actually, I'll tell you what. Why don't you get pressurized in your suit, and uh, we'll see you later on in the show. Okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I'll tell you what. While he's getting pressurized, why don't you guys check this out? Space break! Hey, did you know that if you went out into space without a spacesuit, all of your body fluids would boil? Ew! The first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, it was awesome. And they landed on July 20th, 1969. Hey, did you know that the first American astronaut to do an EVA? That means extravehicular activity. That means going outside your spaceship. Was Edward White on June 3rd, 1965? Guess how many parts of a spacesuit there are. Five? Ten? At least 17. I knew that. You did not. As long as you can stay in the spacesuit on a mission is seven and a half hours. I knew that, too. You did not. Hey, did you know that a spacesuit is made up of nine layers? No, I did not know that. Yes, you did. Space, space. All right, I was wondering if you guys could help me out. I got some items here, and I want you to hold on to them for a couple minutes. We'll get back to them a little later in the show. So why don't you take those for me? And you can hold that. There you go. Take this for me, buddy. And like I said, just hold on to those right now, and we'll use them in just a minute. But right now, it's time for... The Big Question. Okay, I know it's been bothering you all day. You wanted to ask me, what is the big question? How do you go to the bathroom in a space suit? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that's yeah. a good question. Okay, I was hoping you, would, you were going to ask that, actually. You see, every astronaut's space suit has what's called a UCD, or a urine collection device. You guys want to see what one is? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Actually, you're holding one right now. Ew, that's gross. Actually, I think it looks kind of nice to me, but... <laughs> anyways, a uh, urine collection device is basically to uh, collect urine, and... Uh, the urine is stored in here, and when the astronaut goes back to the spaceship, he can dispose of it properly. Of course, um, if you need to collect anything else besides urine, uh, you got to hold it. An EMU can only do so much. Oh my gosh, you didn't use this, did you? That's disgusting. I got to take this back. I'll just put that down there. All right, guys, don't worry. The things you have have nothing to do with bodily functions. As a matter of fact, right now, we're going to guess which of these items was developed as a direct result of space technology, okay? And all of you guys out there, you can help us. See if you can guess before we can which of these items comes from a spacesuit. Is it A, Velcro? Could it be B, fireman's boots? Or C, anti-fog compound? Okay, if you said all of them, you're right, because all three of these items were developed as a direct result of spacesuit technology. Right, guys? Right. All right. Velcro was designed as a fastener for space clothes. It's much simpler and easier to use than laces or buttons. Which is a good call, because imagine tying your tennis shoes in space and having your laces floating off. Doesn't work for me. <laughs> Seriously. This anti-fog compound keeps glasses from fogging up. Scuba divers use it a lot. Yeah, I know. I hate it when I'm up in space and my suit starts to fog up when I'm flying around up there. It's terrible. Firefighters are one of the major users of spacesuit spin-offs. Much of the protective clothing that they wear comes from spacesuit technology. That's right. As a matter of fact, one of the best spin-off developments is the use of the breathing apparatus that firemen wear. 
The system includes a face mask, frame and harness, a warning device, and an air bottle. Since firefighters started using it, smoke inhalation injuries and deaths have been greatly reduced. Today, every major manufacturer of breathing apparatus produces units that incorporate space spin-offs in some form. I guess that's an example of how space technology is saving lives right here on Earth. And there are all kinds of other spin-offs from spacesuits, too. Solar research, communication systems, absorbent materials, medical devices, and many more. If it weren't for space research, we wouldn't have a lot of the things we take for granted every day. And hey, let's face it, Nickelodeon wouldn't have a great show like Launchbox to put in your classrooms. Well, I've had a blast today, guys, and I hope you have too. Let's thank Brad Prouty for coming by and showing us that cool space suit. Thanks a lot, Brad. How do you feel inside that now it's all pressurized? I'm very comfortable. The uh, cooling garment's working well, and, and I can move a lot real easy. Excellent, that's great. All right, guys, let's thank NASA also for some of the great footage we've seen today, and also the Astronaut Memorial Foundation for putting this all together. Guys, I'm Bruce Klassen from Nickelodeon. Keep counting down to the next great episode of Launchbox. See ya! Guys, let's come in and feel a real space you feel like. This show was produced in Nickelodeon Studios at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. The following program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a service of the cable television industry and your local cable company.